Today on Straight Talk Africa, critics are asking whether U.S. African foreign policy is about promoting American values of democracy, freedom of expression, and the rule of law. Or is it driven, as some observers say, by a desire for stability and the fight against terrorism? That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, June 10th. I am Shaka Sali. Well, hello to you, Shaka, and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter. Today, we'll talk about how some political observers view U.S. policy towards Africa. And coming up later in our SCA inbox, we'll share your thoughts on the topic through your emails, tweets, and Facebook comments. Hope you'll stay with us. But first, President Obama is expected to go to Kenya in July. Secretary of State Johnny Kelly made a surprise visit to Somalia in May. He is the first sitting Secretary of State ever to do so and the highest ranking U.S. official to go there in decades. My colleague, Paul Sisko, has more. The unannounced three-hour visit to Mogadishu by U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry signals a readiness to re-engage a country that has been a haven for militants. Kerry met with Somali President Hassan Sheikh Mohamud and his prime minister at the heavily defended airport in Mogadishu. He addressed the Somali population by video. We all have a stake in your success. The world cannot afford to have places on the map that are essentially ungoverned. Three years have passed since a new provisional constitution was adopted and a parliament sworn in. With help from Amazon, Somali forces have pushed al-Shabaab out of major population centers. Kerry said a determined international effort has put virtually all of Somalia's pirates out of business. And he told his Somali host the U.S. is beginning the process of establishing a diplomatic mission in Mogadishu. Kerry's delegation also made a first ever stop in Djibouti. The U.S. conducts drone strikes against extremist commanders from the East African nation. And Kerry's delegation also held talks with Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta in Nairobi, offering more anti-terrorism assistance and addressing other U.S. political concerns. America has learned in our own fight against terrorism that we have to be true to democratic values, not just because it's right, but also because it's the only sure path to security over the long term. So I am glad that today President Kenyatta reinforced his agreement with us that human rights and the rule of law have to be respected in the counterterrorism efforts and that security officials should partner with civil society organizations, especially with those with deep roots in the communities that are scarred by terrorism. Al-Shabaab militants have staged several deadly attacks in Kenya and elsewhere in East Africa. On April 2nd, 148 people were killed in the attack at Carissa University College. Secretary Kerry also spoke in Nairobi on other political conflicts in South Sudan. Because of violence, because of more than two million people who've been displaced from their homes, with each day the ranks of the hungry and the malnourished grow, and none of this had to happen. But it did happen because the country's leaders failed to act on behalf of the best interests of their people and their nation. And he commented on Burundi President Pierre Kurenziz's desire to seek a new five-year term. We are deeply concerned about, uh, uh, about President uh, Nkurunzizi's decision, which flies directly in the face of the constitution of his country. And the violence uh, that is expressing uh, the concern of his own citizens about that choice should be listened to. Representing President Obama, Secretary of State Kerry also attended the historic inauguration of Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari assuring him the United States fully supports its efforts against the Boko Haram insurgency and its economic challenges. 
Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Uh, now joining us here in our Washington studios are two distinguished guests. Dr. Suleiman Nyang, Professor of African Studies and Comparative Politics at Howard University based here in Washington, D.C. And Dr. David Himbara, expert analyst on development issues in Africa, working as a strategist for various institutions and for private sector firms and government departments on the continent. He has also served as private secretary and strategic advisor to Rwandan President Paul Kagame. We were expected to be joined by the U.S. Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, Ambassador Robert Jackson, on today's program. But due to circumstances beyond his control, he was unable to do so. Well, we hope, of course, that uh, one of these days uh, we'll either bring him here or bring uh, Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Linda Thomas Greenfield, herself. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you another time, really, on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you, Wilson. Thank you so much for your invitation. We're yeah. happy to participate. <laughs> You're most welcome. How was your flight from Toronto? Uh, it's just an hour and a half away. It's just a you know, small flight. A city that uh, apparently has the reputation of being one of the cleanest in the world, at least one of the <laughs> top ten. Is that true? Very much so. Top ranked. Very interesting. Yes. And, and guess what? As far as Africa is concerned, uh, you're talking about Johannesburg, uh, which is under 50, somewhere in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-6193-111. Your country code is 1. Let me come here immediately yeah, to yeah. you, uh, uh, Professor Nyang. I know that uh, we've been at this really very many, many times, uh, at least in the last 15 years. Uh, <laughs> you happen to have frankly been one of the original um, analysts on this program called Straight Talk Africa. And in August, it turns, guess what, 15 years young. Congratulations. <laughs> You're most welcome. We've been talking about Africa. We've been talking about uh, U.S. policy towards Africa and what have you. You've heard, of course, that uh, there are people who say that the emphasis seems to be more on stability and uh, security issues, uh, fighting terrorism, for example, as opposed really to promoting American values, talking about democracy, promoting freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of association, talking about rule of law. How do you see it so far? Yeah, I think what is happening really for U.S. policymakers is something that Richard N. Hash at the Council of Foreign Relations made very clear to the Americans. So the American leadership should pay very much attention to dealing with domestic issues and then going abroad to have legitimacy in negotiating with other people. So these ideas people are putting forward with regard to democracy it is an attempt to replicate what has been done over the last 200 years of American republicanism elsewhere. There were a lot of problems in America from the beginning. But over time, Americans developed ways of adjusting with the problem. So when it comes to Africa, state building and nation building are the critical issues. When Bill Clinton came to the White House, he was, in a way, naive, in my opinion, to assume that those people who are emerging in East Africa we are going to be visionaries who will change Africa. It didn't happen because what has happened really is in many of those African countries, the legacies of Kwame Nkrumah with one party state, with people like Leopold Senghor and Nyerere and others, gradually move away from one party dictatorship to open the political system so that other political parties can exist. Mm -hmm. When Bill Clinton came to the White House, instead of pushing that frontier forward so that you will have pluralism in political parties, they begin to support people who went back to square one. That's why you have u turn in Uganda with Museveni. You, you talked about, of course, uh, his admiration for leaders in East Africa. It's not just East Africa, maybe Eastern and Central Africa, because we are clearly talking about uh, beginning from Eritrea, Isaias Afawaki. We go down to Ethiopia, Meres Zenawi, 
we go down to Uganda, Yoweri Museveni. We go to Rwanda. You could say, of course, Paul Kagame. And at the time, we're talking 1997, 98, Rora Desi Kabira of DRC. And uh, he called them, at least his administration, they used to call them a new bleed of African leaders. And they went even further to say that, in fact, these people were the beacons of hope for African democracy. Is there any democracy from Asimara through to Kinshasa? Nothing at all. I would say this categorically. Because right now, I'm very much disturbed about what's happening in Eritrea. Personally, I was involved when Isaias was here with Barakat Selassie. He was teaching in our department. I was with him when they were nobody. They were not in power yet. Mm. If Carl, Herman Cohen and others didn't broker the peace in England, at Lancaster House, for right. his narrative. Right. I remember him very well as a person. When Barack Selassie was in our department, working for them. When I read in the internet now, what is happening to these Eritreans? I'm very disappointed. Because you have thousands of Eritreans that are dying in the Mediterranean now. There are Eritreans who are now in Israel in jail. Some of them are killed by ISIS. They are very disturbed about what's happening now. Unfortunately, the Israeli government had worked out a deal with Kagame to get all those illegal immigrants, Eritreans, to be sent to Rwanda. Rwanda. This is the latest agreement. Very interesting. Which is uh, sad. Very interesting, Himbara. So uh, the illegal uh, aliens in Israel are headed to your motherland, Rwanda? <laughs> <laughs> but Shaka, no, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> if I could respond to the same question you, you, you posed to my colleague. The new bleed of African leaders? Yeah, basically the United States uh, approach that seems to have kind of... Um, shifted from de uh, strengthening uh, democratic uh, institutions, the rule of law, onto the issues of uh, stability and peace and that kind of and, and terrorism and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I want to be a bit kinder to the, uh, to the, uh, yes. to the United States. Mm -hmm. And, here's and other, perhaps other development partners for that matter. No, I sp I'm talking about United yes. States for one particular reason. Mm -hmm. I think that the uh, U.S. is a great friend of African people. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? If I see, for example, uh, the support the United States gives to Africa, uh, all did enough uh, this, uh, the, the, the great support began under the most, most unlikely uh, head of state here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. uh, at, when he came in, the t basically the U.S. was supporting Africa by you know, a sum of uh, around $2 billion mm -hmm. dollars a year. Mm -hmm. uh, he pushed that up at the time he was leaving office to eight billion a year. You're talking about uh, George Bush. PEPFA? Yeah. The, no, no, PEPFA I'm, program? no, I'm talking about the general. Th these mm -hmm. would be health yeah, programs. Related, uh, 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 fighting malaria, tuberculosis. Yes, but HIV, also AIDS. economic AIDS. development, mm -hmm. agriculture. But what about Bill Clinton? We're talking about <laughs> Agoa. No, 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 no. That came later. No, no so, much earlier. Before, okay, so, so let, let's, let's, let's forget him for the time being. I'm talking now about <laughs> the, the figures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then President Obama came in. The figure climbed. Now we are talking 10 billion. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let me, let, let, let's us also give them um, Americans credit. Mm -hmm. They make the right noise. Right. So the, the United States stands for democracy, the rule of law. Uh, lately, they are on the record saying that uh, whether the, the, these African leaders that want to cling on to power, whether they are, they are friends or not friends, they must not amend constitutions to suit their own ends. We'll come okay. back so, uh, to that <laughs> aspect later because the time happens not to be our best so, ally. So in a nutshell, so, so in a nutshell in, I agree mm -hmm. that there is a shift for, from uh, democratic uh, concerns mm -hmm. onto anti-terrorism that 
is very problematic. Yes. We'll, we'll come back later to yeah, that. We'll come back to it. Now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website Twitter. And we are tweeting live. <laughs> Follow us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka. And join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA USA Africa Policy. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keywords Straight Talk Africa, become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please don't go away. Let's take a look at the five pillars of U.S. policy towards Africa. Number one, support democracy and the strengthening of democratic institutions, including free, fair, and transparent elections. Number two, support African economic growth and development. Number three, assist in conflict prevention, mitigation, and resolution. Number four, support presidential initiatives such as the Global Health, Feed the Future, and the Global Climate Change Initiative. Number five, work with African nations on multinational issues such as drug smuggling, money laundering, illicit arms, and human trafficking. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111, U.S. Country Code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question, keep your comment brief, and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizuyu Iwat. And of course, this is Straight Talk Africa coming to you live from Washington. I'm sorry that uh, I had to interject uh, Dr. Himbara because uh, there is no democracy in Studio 52. If you are told by the producer to go for a break, you have to go. Yes. So I hope you'll find some space in your beautiful Rwandan heart. Forgive me for that. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. <laughs> now, David, uh, you, you, you talked about, of course, uh, how the U.S. government now seems to be focusing on the issue of respect for term limits in as far as Africa is concerned. Is that what we are trying to say? Yes, please. Does this, in a way, remind you of uh, a major statement made by uh, U.S. President Barack Obama back in 2009 mm. in Accra, the Ghanaian capital, and I was there with him. He talked about how Africa does not need strong men. It needs rather strong institutions. There are a lot of people, in fact, uh, who have been saying that uh, he pretty much talked the talk and has not been able so far to walk that talk. Do you agree with those critics? Uh, no, 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 I don't. Mm -hmm. um, you see, it takes two people to tango. Mm -hmm. The United States is not Africa. When, I think we have to be very sympathetic when we have to look at the people he has to deal with, mm -hmm. the leaders of Africa. Let's quickly take a look. Let's quickly take a stock. Say, on the democratic front, that, you know, countries not on, not only, that not only have elections, but have independent judiciary, yeah, space between parliaments and the executive, uh, regular credible elections. How many of those? I can count a handful. We can talk about Senegal. We can talk about Ghana. We can talk about South Africa. We can talk about Tanzania. We can talk about Botswana. Mauritius. Mauritius. Namibia. And in Namibia. Yes. Benin. Benin, yes. uh, there, there is a the talk of third uh, term. Yeah, but I don't think uh, it's okay. okay. We, have, we went away from uh, dictator Matthew Kareku. 
Okay, very, very good. So you have those. Nigeria, of course. You can't oh, forget course. Nigeria, the yeah. big one. Yes. Imagine we are celebrating. <laughs> Imagine we are celebrating the fact mm -hmm. that someone gives power to a winner. Is that, isn't that incredible? An incumbent <laughs> in <laughs> Africa yes. yeah. handing over power peacefully yeah. <laughs> to a leader of a major opposition political party. That speaks volumes, Shaka. But of course, <laughs> you cannot, for example, underestimate the pressure that also came from Washington yes. and London. That okay. those elections had to be elections, not selections. Very good. So, on one hand, you have those. But now, on the extreme end, you have what I call uh, the ten dinosaurs. <laughs> These are rulers that have been in power for at least 20 years. Mm -hmm. There you have the, 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 the Angola, Equatoria Guinea. Teodoro Biang. Yes, uh, you've got uh, uh, Guinea, uh, your Jose, homeland. Jose <laughs> dos Santos <laughs> of Angola. Yeah, your, 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 your homeland. Jose uh, Museveni, of course, of Uganda. Uh, of course, we have the, Robert Gabriel uh, Mugabe. I have the Cameroon. <laughs> Paul <Yeah>. Bia. <laughs> Cameroon. So you, ha you have that. What about Paul Kagame, by the okay, way? Okay, now, <laughs> among the ten, I pull out two. All right. that they have gone even beyond the pale. I call those totalitarian. Because even the, the other eight, you know, in, if, take, take Uganda, for example. There is what you could call media. The judiciary once in a while pa passes, uh, uh, overrules the state. Uh, the, the opposition, well, okay, they are beaten, but they are there. They hold, quote unquote, periodic elections? Uh, yes, okay. Are they elections real? Okay, so hold on, hold mm -hmm. on to the point. Mm -hmm. But now the other two I'm talking about. Mm. I'm talking about Eritrea, mm -hmm. I'm talking about Rwanda. Mm. These are totalitarian states. What so, about Equatorial Guinea? I, I, I would, uh, there I, I, don't correct, I, I don't put it in that category. Here is where, how I define it. The last okay. election, you go to 97%. No, no, it's not the election I'm talking Jesus about. Christ, if he came back here, <laughs> no, no. frankly, as no, much no. as his beloved. No, all the 10 have no credible elections. That we agree. But the two I'm talking about, Wonder it's beyond that. It's beyond this. Why is it beyond, beyond okay. that? The definition is here that it's that drive to control the mind, to control everything of, a, of the citizen. At least they don't pretend. Yes, they don't pretend. Yes. Where every 10 houses, mm -hmm. anyone who does anything in, in every 10 houses or Mudugudu in Rwanda, the state will know. Just like that. Now, I don't think such a thing is possible in Uganda. Uganda is too chaotic. People go, go around their business. Actually, yes. it is very interesting that you say that because yeah. uh, that system was, in fact, directly borrowed, guess where? From Uganda. Yeah. But Except that in Uganda, it. it doesn't work anymore. But, yes. but they, have another, in, they have other structures. Yes. Which <laughs> essentially are through the state. Okay. They call them district security officers. And down there, you have Gomborora and what have you. Until you get those 10 houses you are talking about, my friend. And all these people, by the way, borrowed the system from a man who used to be called the king of African kings, brother leader, Colonel Muhammad Gaddafi of brother, Libya. Let, let me tell you what, what we're talking about here, the, the, the difference of the other two I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Forty bodies found floating in a lake. Uh, people assassinated in South Africa. Mm -hmm people who oppose the, 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 the regime. Mm -hmm. um, they oppose, basically, three things, there are, three things happen to anyone who fall out of line. In prison, disappearance, mm -hmm. death. So you've also been following the African scene. Do you agree with Dr. Himbara? Yeah, I will support and I want to amplify the point he's making. I have been saying this over and over again in many places, in America and elsewhere. When you look at nation building and state building in Africa, what he is saying, he comes with the metaphor of the ten dinosaurs in African politics. Now, you can go critically, you can have a good master student or PhD student to really take each one of these people and talk about. Right now, they talk about North Korea on the Red Sea. Somebody is making a metaphor out of it. Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about 
Isaiah and the Eritreans. You know, they have a great name. Eritrea is a Greek word for the Red Sea in Greece, in, in ancient Greek. Mm -hmm. So they're making a pun on that. <laughs> North Korea in yeah. the Red Sea. Right. You see, the dictatorship, they are parallel. Kagame and Isaiah are similar. What he is saying, they learn from Museveni. And then he brought another metaphor, which is now totally discredited, Gaddafi. Gaddafi ruled from 1969 when he took power from a royal family until he King died Idris. over 40 years. You see, one thing that has to be borne in mind about these new dictatorships, that's why I want the American government to be pushed forward. During Obama's last days, we had a dialogue here before. I told you, it's not over. Obama is going to push. He's gonna, we have to push these people towards democracy. You cannot do it. It takes two to tango. You cannot change African dictatorship unless the African people wake up. Absolutely. So the Senegalese proved that. The Senegalese proved that. With Abdel what? Yeah. He wanted to follow Obama, uh, Obasanjo. Obasanjo was supporting him. He wanted to have a third term. You raised a very interesting question. In fact, when you talk about uh, these totalitarian dictators and what have you, someone will quickly say, why don't the people vote them yeah, they, out? Yeah. Like they <laughs> voted out, for example, Abdul Wadi in Senegal, like, for example, the Nigerians refused uh, to grant Urushegun oh, Obasanjo a third term. Yes. Like, they refused to grant a third term to Frederick Chiruba of Zambia. Yes. Like, they refused to grant a third term to Bakiri Muluzi yes, of yes, Malawi. Yes. Why can't that happen in Rwanda? Why can't it happen in Uganda? Why can't it happen in uh, Equatorial Guinea? Why can't it happen in uh, Cameroon? In the Sudan, in the South Sudan. What? No, okay, no, okay. Now in Eritrea, see, in Ethiopia. No, no. See, I think you are raising a very fundamental issue. And most of our colleagues who are political scientists, whether they are in America or in Oxford or in Australia, they are looking at it. The problem of these tyrannies in Africa. How do you grapple with these tyrannies? Many of our scholars in the 70s and 80s who were addressing Mobutu and others, these were beneficiaries of the Cold War. Museveni. Isaiah and others benefited from a presidential handshake of Bill Clinton. In many yeah, ways, Clinton, Bill Clinton, in fact, Clinton has actually characterized him. And I was watching him on television, on CNN, when Bill Clinton was in Haiti during the earthquake. He said, why doesn't Haiti learn from Rwanda, for example, where you have this incredible leader, Paul Kagame, who he characterized as one of the greatest leaders of our time. Mm -hmm. A man who has pulled off remarkable reconciliation, for example. You know, I was not born speaking English. But at least I happen to know that when you talk about reconciling, you talk about two groups of people being reconciled, correct? Yes. Now, I'm wondering, of course, uh, whether that has really happened. And in fact, Tony Blair, a man who came from a country that, in fact, invented or discovered the Magna Charta, who went to Oxford to boot, just like uh, Bill Clinton, the Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, has described Paul Kagame as a visionary leader. Mm, yeah. These people must know what they are talking about. In any case, let's go for a break, and we'll come back to that. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more discussion in a moment. But first, here is Maria Majero. Take it away, Maria. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the outstanding feedback we've received from our audience through social media. But now, here is our letter of the week from a Straight Talk Africa Facebook fan who responded to our question of the week. Often Jeremiah from Kampala in Uganda writes, U.S. policy has been a 50-50. That's what I think in promoting democracy and rule of law on the continent. This is why the U.S. will support or side with leaders who are their puppets. But the U.S. has also helped bring about good governance and respect for rule of law and democracy in Africa. But in the end, it's up to us, the Africans, to bear the greatest responsibility to do it. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like 
Follow, join, VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on the Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizuyu Ewart, and welcome back to Spray Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Promoting freedom and democracy and protecting human rights around the world are central to U.S. foreign policy, and it definitely seemed to be the purpose of U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's recent trip to Kenya, Somalia, Djibouti, and Nigeria. His travel comes ahead of President Barack Obama's scheduled visit to Kenya in July for the Global Entrepreneurship Summit, a forum that connects local businesses with international groups and government. This leads us to our question of the week asking, to what extent, in your view, is U.S. policy promoting democracy and the rule of law in Africa? Well, thanks, uh, everyone, for using all our social media platform to communicate to us. Let's begin with a comment from Obute Onwuka uh, from Yola in Nigeria, who writes, their policies are hurting U.S. Their policies are hurting us, actually. Rather, they aren't encouraging peace. Rather, they indirectly promote war through some zealous politicians in order to tap into our natural resources. Has anybody noticed that America does not intervene in a country with little or no resources? Well, another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Use the hashtag VOA US Africa policy. If you haven't yet, please follow us at VOA Shaka. And speaking of it, let's go to a tweet from Jackson Peter of Cape Town in South Africa, who tweets that US policy toward Africa it's a win-win relation for greedy African leaders, but win-lose for the people. Blame Africa, not the United States. Well, let's take a look at another tweet, uh, this time from Collins uh, Upson from the United States. He tweets that this policy can work if Africans are ready to obey and if the USA can give a clean policy. Well, Shaka, a range of opinions here. Your take on this. Comments. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Professor of Comparative Politics and African Studies, your response, your reaction to that? Yeah, I think all of the people who are over there, they're undercoing the reality, to be or not to be. It is very interesting that Ali Masru is gone. We lost Ali a lot. Ali Masru would have written a very interesting piece about the inauguration of Buhari. Shakespeare is still alive. Shakespeare is still alive in Nigerian politics because Buhari quoted Shakespeare and somebody quoted when they said there's a tide in the affairs of men. <laughs> At floor, yes, <laughs> yes at the indeed. You see, so what is very interesting, when Chaka brought the issue with regard to these dictators in Africa, you go back to Shakespeare, you talk about many people being killed. You go back to what Shakespeare said about evil leaders, evil people, when he said, the evil that lives after them, you see, but their good are entered in their bones. So Museveni, Kagame, and all these monsters that you are identifying, they have grandkids. They must remember what their grandkids are going to be thinking about, because you see, you are going to be marginalized. So if your grandfather is a president or a leader and he doesn't behave well, they should pay attention to their grandkids. But what about the issue of accountability? If in fact you agree that instead of being uh, perhaps a new bleed of African leaders, who obviously are also the beacons of hope for African democracy, that in fact perhaps they may, in fact, uh, perhaps they should be referred to as a new bleed of African dictators. A new bleed of dictators who have read Shakespeare, 
Bernard Shaw, Shaw sir, who have read, of course, uh, Ngugi wa Thiongo, <laughs> who know about Thomas Jefferson, yes. who know about nice. John <laughs> Fittizewe Kennedy, Kennedy saying, ask not yeah. what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I mean, they present themselves like that. Why can't they be considered to be a new bleed of African <laughs> leaders? Shaka, uh, the, 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 you, you asked a very, very important, important question earlier that I, I must go back to. It's related to what you're saying. You asked, how come African people are not rebelling against these dinosaurs? If they are that bad. Yes, if they are that bad. The African people are actually, in fact, doing it. The Burkina, the Burkini yeah, Bay baby, baby, baby. said, enough is enough. They sent the, 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 the dictator. And some blaze. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Blaze. People in DRC Congo, they said, no, enough is enough. They went in the streets. The Senate had to stop its plan of playing around with the Constitution. In Burundi. In the Burundi, <laughs> people on the streets. Now, the only difference is where, again, is the totalitarian tool that I'm, I talked about. Let me, let me give you... Let but people will argue back, uh, you know, uh, if I may say, because we have to go for another, you know, interaction with my colleague before we come to that. Yeah. Just sit on that thought. Yeah. And I will come back yeah. to you, and we'll talk about it. Okay. okay. Mariama. <laughs> Do you have any more feedback to share with our audience, please? <laughs> um, absolutely. Let's move on uh, to a posting from Michael uh, Tite uh, from Tema in Ghana who writes, why do we always look up to them, in this case the United States, before we do what is right? What is right that we don't have as a continent. We don't need the U.S. in Africa. We are capable of making this continent a better place. The corrupt leadership in Africa is why the U.S. has taken advantage of the African continent. <laughs> well, while we're at it, let's take a look at another Facebook comment, this time from Christopher Mpokigwa, uh, I think I got the name right, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, who writes, America does not promote democracy in Africa, but it promotes her interests regardless whether a particular state is democratic or not. Shaka, not a lot of love here. Once again, uh, is it fair? And uh, your thoughts on these comments? Certainly not, Maria. So what about that, uh, the good professor, the good doctor? Yes. <laughs> so the, the, the totalitarian, why are they people not rising? I was saying that. Yes. In fact, it's funny that you mentioned, it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, uh, Bill Clinton painted the Ruth Rose picture about Rwanda in Haiti. Yes. Do you actually know that this so-called Singapore of Africa, Rwanda, it's poorer than Haiti? You are talking about the Singapore of <laughs> Lee Kuan Yew? Yes. Uh, the, uh, the, the per capita income in Haiti is $800. Uh, uh, $800. Yes. In Rwanda, it's 630 But Haiti, of course, uh, lives in the Western Hemisphere where okay. the cost of living is much so higher. So never mind, never mind. So mm -hmm. now, here is the surprise. When, in, in a few months, you are actually going to see millions of people onto the streets of Kigali mm -hmm. demanding that Kagame mm -hmm. remains king. Yes. Oh and how has he done that? The Nyumbakumi. He has already intimidated three million Rwandans. These are villagers. And, how, how do you know that? Uh, you are not there. Someone might, or someone might ask. Ah, what is the evidence? <laughs> there is a lot of evidence. For example, F first hear me out. First hear me out. Yeah. The evidence is simply this: the genuine uh, opposition people, as I said, are either in prison, they are in exile, they are dead, or they are dead. Mm -hmm. So, the the what you may call political parties in Rwanda are the ones actually who are leading the campaign to change the constitution. And they are about 10. Yeah, so that Kagame stays in power. What about uh, the party and so, the supporters and of, of Victor Ngavire? What about the supporters and the party of Victor Ngavire, for example, who is in prison? 
Well, but, but where is the space? What, what, what do you think they can do? They can't do Does much. Does she deserve an opinion? The, if the leader is in, is in prison, the party is not registered, so what do you expect? What, what Are you suggesting that the vast majority of the Rwandese people have abdicated their citizenship, their responsibility, and are not in the business of even pretending to own the right to own an opinion? In Rwanda, and the same thing as Eritrea, you faced three choices. Either toe the line, or lose your livelihood by taking an opinion, disappear, or die. Interestingly, but, but, but I have been told that uh, Rwanda is doing the right thing, that when it comes to the issue of service delivery, that is like a world champion. He is a surprise shaka, and, and this goes to the, uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the commentaries that are uh, talking about the United States. The ambassador of the United States in 2012, Susan Rice, she goes to Kigali. She says, in a public statement, says, Rwanda has improved delivery. But however, the delivery is what we see here in the city. But behind the city, there is a darker side. People disappear. So United States was giving a signal. Well, she was then, of course, uh, U.S. Ambassador to the United yes, Nations. Yes. Now she even better. Mm. She is the National Security Advisor. Yes. But I have yet to hear a statement from the White House. Yes. Now, the, the United States, on two occasions in the, in the last week, a statement was made. No, three times. Whether you are our friend or an adversary, mm. when it comes to the issue of amending the Constitution to remain a strong man, it's non-negotiable. I'm afraid uh, time is not our best. Yes. I will have to come back to that later. Thanks, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, that does it for today's social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com. Or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. Now, let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, heads of states are meeting at the African Union Assembly in Johannesburg. We'll discuss their agenda and respond to a daunting number of vital concerns next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. I understand that uh, there are, of course, uh, um, telephone callers uh, from uh, the lifeline of the show. And, of course, uh, those are telephone calls from the African continent. Uh, good evening, Andrew from Uganda. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Oh, thank you, Mr. Shaka. How are you? I am hugely terrific. How are you today? Good, good. Uh, Mr. Shaka, uh, I want to tell you the U.S. approach um, for the, the foreign policy approach, I think, beginning with the Clinton time or even before them, their, 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 their foreign policy has been to export democracy and its, its principles to foreign countries or to foreign nations. But I want to ask you, Mr. Shaka, you tell me just one country. Mention one country that is better off democratically because of the U.S. intervention. For example, they were in Somalia in 1998, they went to Kosovo, they were in Bosnia, they were in Haiti, they, they talk of Afghanistan, the crisis in Iraq, recently in, in Libya. 
all in the name of exporting democracy and its, and, and its principles. Are these countries any better, Mr. Shaka? Secondly... So what would you like, I, I, uh, what, what would you like uh, to see being exported from uh, the United States to Africa? Dictatorship? You, you, you see, to fight tyranny and oppression, using tyrannical and oppressive means... Are you suggesting... Are you, are you a single-minded ruthless fanaticism by becoming equally ruthless and fanatical will not cause any justice or bring about any meaningful democracy. Are you suggesting, yes, are you suggesting my brother, frankly, that uh, fighting terrorism or service yes. delivery and democracy are mutually exclusive in your view? But, but the, I, I am only concerned with the intervention. I think the, the, least, the, the least time unit needed for democracy to prosper, to prosper is, is at least a generation. You cannot expect a, a, a country like Rwanda, Rwanda or, or, or that was in the crisis just yesterday to, to have all ideas of democracy well uh, what about uh, what about a country like Germany? The last time I checked, uh, Germany, of course, was involved in two world wars, losing them very, very badly. Uh, but if you yeah. go there, I'm sure that uh, it will be a different ball game. Well, a reminder that you are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. If you wish to participate in our discussion, please call us at 202-619-3111. This country code is one. I'll continue our discussion in a moment, and so please... Don't go away. The Bureau of African Affairs has contributed to demonstrable progress in each of these areas in recent years. It has worked to strengthen democratic transitions in Ivory Coast, Guinea, and Niger, successful elections in Nigeria, and an independence referendum in South Sudan. The Bureau promotes African economic development through the annual Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. It actively works to end sexual and gender-based violence in the Democratic Republic of Congo and seeks to eliminate atrocities perpetrated by the Lord's Resistance Army throughout Central Africa. Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global food security initiative, focuses on 12 African countries. And finally, the Global Health Initiative hopes to invest $63 billion over six years to help partner countries improve the health of women, newborns, and children. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com. Or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizu Ewart. And of course, welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, coming to you live from Washington. Once again, let's go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Good evening, Patrick, from the great nation of Nigeria. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Yeah, good evening, Mr. Saka. My name is Patrick Okrafo in Nigeria. My Mr. Saka, my question goes to our guest tonight. You see, this issue of fighting terrorism, terror terrorists, the terrorists stay in our community, and the traditional owners know people that are in their community. And I want to find out from our guest, why is it that our traditional owners, they are not making an effort to let the government know what is happening in their community, so that this issue of people coming to say that they know them and they don't want to tell the government why is this so? Now look at what is happening in Burundi. The Burundi head of the state he has been anointed by God. Fine. I agree that God anointed him, but this issue that the Israel are there, they will not tell him the truth that this is what the people are saying and they will close their mouth. Why is this so? Thank Patrick you. Okafo is my name in Nigeria. Thank, Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, terrific question. In fact, uh, Patrick might have added that uh, 
the African leaders, who of course someone might call rulers, when they get this cooperation with the Eastern world about fighting terrorism, it is like a gold scent because I have heard they use it in fact against legitimate political opposition. Have you experienced that, uh, Himbara? Yeah, well, again, Rwanda is a case in the point. Rwanda has become uh, the, third, no, the fifth largest uh, peacekeeping country. Mm -hmm. And how did they manage to do that? And it's they are doing a very good job, by the way. Yeah, so you can't take that credit away from Rwanda. Yeah, so part of the, it's the U.S. provides logistics, the planes that take the soldiers, the training, and so on. But the question... They were the first to go to Darfur? Yeah, so here yeah, is the question. The Central African Republic? So here is the question. You support a military to go and do this impressive work. But the same military... That is, that, is, that is repressing its own citizens. It's the, same, it's, right. it's, it's the same machinery. It's the same machinery that goes to cause trouble in DRC. Is the international community aware of that? Well, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> well, we know that the international community is, is aware of that because in, the 20, in the 2012, the donors led by the United States cut or suspended aid from Rwanda precisely because of its sponsor of terror in DRC. And Rwanda threatened to withdraw its peacekeepers and then they from kept around the world. Yes. So you, you see the contradiction. I see. So prof a professional army go and peace, keep peace, but cause the chaos in the neighborhood I and see. terrorize your citizen. Let's mm. go to, yeah. again to the lifeline of the show, uh, which of course are the telephone <laughs> callers. Uh, Good evening, uh, Samuel yeah, from Uganda. Yeah. You're most welcome straight to Africa. Uh, good evening, Shata Sali. How are you? You are terrific. How are you today? I'm very fine. Uh, let me uh, push this question to my friend, Professor Nyan, whom we have been uh, on straight talk Africa for so many years. <laughs> Professor Nyan, sir, how is United States policy towards Africa going to uh, support democracy rule of law, African economic growth, and hmm. global climate change. And uh, the next, uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm proposing, if President Obama is coming in July to Africa, uh, is it possible for him to stop at Entebbe Airport on his way to Nairobi, Kenya? <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> well, looks like uh, you're a very, very important person right here. Oh. <laughs> Go for it. Go for the answer, man. He needs the answer. What I can say to him really is, I told you, Shaka, that the Obama administration is not finished with Africa yet. He has his second term going through. We have to make sure that all the points he's in, these, dragon, these dinosaurs. <laughs> monsters, these dinosaurs, uh, you see, like an apple on the tree about to fall. Mm -hmm. That's the best metaphor one can identify them. And these people's longevity in office is not good for themselves if they want to really have good legacies and to be remembered by their people. So what President Obama is going to do, he has to really look back at Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, remember, was very much for democracy and human, human rights, rights against Idi Amin. But Remember became, that? Guess what? He became one term U.S. president. Yeah, that's for the problem for him, you see. Mm. So the thing is, is, both Bill Clinton, George Bush Jr., and President Obama have two terms. We have to build on this momentum so that whoever is the president of the United States next time around, what Richard Haas was saying to the Americans, let's deal with our own domestic problem first. Then we can go and help the other people. It takes two to tango. It takes two to tango, but I think more importantly, frankly, it seems to me from all I have seen, the answer has to come from the African people. It Absolutely. has to. Because the intellectual and information balance of power has been shifting in their favor. Yes. They, they have to wake work. up and assert their citizenship. I yes. agree with that. I Not accept to be treated as subjects. Really. No, I right. agree with that. Agree Let's with go that. to, again, the lifeline of the show. Good afternoon, Mary from the state of Maryland. You're most welcome straight okay. to Africa. Yes, Chester, thank you for giving me the chance. Uh, actually, two ideas. Simon, the first one is, 
you have a minute. You have a minute, Mary. You have a minute. Time will not have best life, please. Perfect, perfect. Uh, on the issue of uh, what U.S. is doing, it's actually doing a great job, but it's our duty as uh, Africans, as they have said, to implement that. And with that, I will simply go to Liberia with the pre uh, President uh, Salif. When you asked her what she wants to be remembered for when she leaves office, she said, I want Liberians to know that when I met them, I changed their lives, and when I leave, they will remember that I changed their lives. I want to actually to add positively, because you can change life either positively or negatively. So that is our take as, uh, as Africans, so that when you are in power, respect, come with it. I mean, if, if, do what you can in that period, and then leave the office so that you you be an example to others to Point. respect to the Constitution. Point well made. Really? But what about the argument of the supporters of term limits who say that uh, you're looking at an individual who is unique Someone that you, you know can't why? possibly see in the next 100 years. You know why? That is, for the case of Rwanda, it's a, a special case because this is a country which has had a lot of atrocities, so they don't trust the leaders to be sincere. That's why I'm saying, actually, they should be given another chance, not of the person in the office, but another person to try out. Thank you. But these are people mm -hmm. who are really traumatized. Don't thank you. Case. Thank so you very much. Uh, well... They say that Kagame, of course, uh, is, uh, has created a Singapore, uh, frankly, a Singapore of Africa. And yet, when you look, when compare and contrast from what I hear, I don't see how you can compare Kagame with Lee Kuan Yew. Lee no, Kuan Yew no, no, was no. a uniter. No. He was a reconciler. He was a man who reached out to the Mali, the majority population, who were underdeveloped and brought them up. He did not have, uh, he did not have this vanity thing. He, did not, he was not a person who liked money big projects and stuff like that. So it's a totally different ball game. Unfortunately, time is not our best ally. Yeah, we have right, to go yeah. to a very bad situation here. Before we go, we would be remiss if I didn't mention the death of Kenyan scholar and economist, Professor Mwangi mm. Kimenyi, who mm. passed away on Saturday, June 6, mm. in Baltimore, Maryland, after lengthy illness. At the time of his death, Dr. Kimenyi was a former director and senior researcher fellow at the Africa Growth Initiative at the Brookings Institution, based here in Washington, D.C., known as a highly respected economist globally. Dr. Kimenyi has taught economics for several years and has worked for the World Bank, the United Nations, and African Development Bank. He also served as a member of the advisory board of the School of Economics at the University of Nairobi. He was the founding executive director of the Kenya Institute for Public Policy and Research Analysis in Kenya, or known as KIPLA, from 1999 to 2005. During the 15 years that we have been on air, Dr. Kimenyi became a staple on Straight Talk Africa for his expert analysis on the African continent. His last appearance on this program was January 14th of this year. He will be truly missed among my colleagues here at The Voice of America. I had felt condolences to his family. May his soul rest in peace mm -hmm. eternally. Mm -hmm. On that note, thanks to our distinguished guests, Dr. Suleiman Nyang, Professor of African Studies and Comparative Politics at Howard University, based here in Washington, D.C., and Dr. David Himbara, expert analyst on development issues in Africa. Thanks to our Fiat stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Day of Break Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better Africa. And please remember to keep the African hope alive.